Okay, so um, okay, so part two of the discourse on inequality. Uh, unless there are questions about the assignment or something. Okay. Um, so um, now this is the part where. Rousseau has to actually answer the Academy's question. And uh, you remember the Academy's question, I just erased it, but it had these two parts. Um, what is the origin of inequality among men? And is it authorized by the law of nature? Uh, Professor, did you write anything on the board? I am writing on the board. Is it not showing? Yeah, it's not no, showing. It's All right. It's, uh, Okay, there's a question about lock. Let me get my board back first. It's going to be this one. Yes, there you go. All right. So the question uh, was when you get the chance. Okay, now there's a question about prompt three. Let me get to this first. When you get the chance, can you explain nature? Explain why, according to Locke, the property so acquired will initially be A, quite limited, and B, more or less equally distributed to everyone, especially B. So, um, and uh, Cameron said, I think because it's against the law of nature to take more than what you can use before it spoils. Yes. That's, in a nutshell, that's the answer. It's uh, in the state of nature, according to Locke, you can make anything your property by mixing your labor with it, but uh, you're limited to possessing as much as you can use before it spoils. So uh, if you have things that uh, you can't use before they spoil, you have to give them away. Um, and, you know, assuming that most people are able to gather as much as they need for their, you know, their personal needs, which since Locke assumes that the state of nature is, is basically a state of plenty for the most part, most people can. So that means that everyone has about as much as they need and not more. So therefore, it's uh, more or less equally distributed until the invention of money. Okay, so that was one question. Now here's another question about prompt three uh, on the second assignment. Explain why this act of setting up the Commonwealth is a two-step process in which the first step requires unanimity among the prospective citizens of the new Commonwealth, whereas the second step is by majority rule. Why is the resulting legislative unauthorized to give commands to or about particular individuals? That is, why can it legislate only in universal terms? Okay, so I mean, uh, the first part of that is something I talked about already in Hobbes, and I talked about again in Locke, and we're going to see it again in the uh, reading from Rousseau next week. Um, and um, it's this two-step process. So like in order to form a civil state, um, we, there has to be some kind of covenant um, between all the people who are gonna form the new state. 
they have to mutually lay down their rights or they have to mutually assign rights to someone or something, right? But in any case, they all have to do it. Whoever doesn't do it isn't part of that covenant and so is not part of that um, commonwealth that's being created. I mean, according to Hobbes, the Commonwealth that's being created could conquer those other people and force them to belong. According to Locke, it can't even do that, right? So it has to be by consent. Um, it has to be by unanimous consent, meaning just whoever doesn't consent is not part of the new Commonwealth. So, uh, but then the second stage, and um, Locke has a fair amount to say about this, about, you know, you, so, that, so in order to form a commonwealth, now we're gonna have to decide, like, what form of government will it have? And um, if it's gonna be a monarchical or aristocratic or mixed government, then we're gonna have to select some particular officers, right? Like someone is gonna have to be the king or the president or the senate or whatever. Um, so both of those decisions have to be made, um, but uh, um, Locke says if require unanim unanimity for decisions like that, that, there'll never be any decision. There has to be another rule, and then he and Hobbes both try to argue that the other rule, at least by default, should be ruled by majority. So those are the two steps. I mean, you might think I'm giving away the answer to the question, but I've learned from experience that I'm, you know, even if I directly say the answer to the question, I'm lucky if people understand me well enough to answer it. <laughs> Plus, you know, to answer the question, well, you should refer to the text where Locke says this. Um, so, uh, and the second part is why is the resulting legislative unauthorized to give commands to or about particular individuals? So this part is harder, but it's, you know, it has to do with um, why we're leaving the state of nature, according to Locke. So, like, if you look at the places where he describes what the inconveniences were in the state of nature, and then he says, and therefore, the new commonwealth, like, what we've, the powers we've given up to it must be exactly the powers that are needed to remove, remove this inconven these inconveniences. And essentially, like, being subject to someone else's arbitrary will, like, I like you, so I'm going to give you this, or I don't like you, so I'm not, or whatever, is one of the inconveniences we're trying to get away from. I mean, that's, that's making it a little bit simpler than it actually is. I, you know, I think I discussed it at greater length in a lecture when I talked about why we don't want to give our uh, authority to any private will and how Locke understands a private will to be a will that has private interests that recognizes one person over another. But, you know, anyway, to make a long story short, it's that's why the resulting legislative doesn't have that power because if we didn't give it powers that would be, would be bad for us. We only that would make things worse. We only gave it powers that would make things better. Okay, I hope that helps. Are there further questions about stuff like that? Okay, back to Rousseau. So, and now you can see what I wrote on the board. So, right, there were two parts to the Academy's question, the origin of inequality among quote-unquote men, and two, is it authorized by the law of nature? So um, the answer to the to one is going to be well, it's complicated, and it's complicated because there are several different kinds of moral or political inequality. Now, remember at the beginning of uh, the discourse, Rousseau said there's also natural inequality, but you're not asking about that. That comes to be by nature. So um, there's several types of um, moral or political inequality. And um, at the beginning of part one, or in page 45, um, 
Rousseau actually lists several of them. The inequality that um, comes about by being richer or more honored. Um, or more powerful. Or finally, by, you know, um, well, he says, you know, uh, in some cases, you can even cause others to be obeyed by them. So uh, I don't know how to write that. Um, mastership. That's not really. That's not really the right word. Uh, but like being a master, <laughs> um, right? Like the right to give commands to other people that they have to obey. Um, which and so that's a form of inequality because they have to obey you and not vice versa, presumably. Um, so these different types of inequality have different origins, according to Rousseau. Um, but um, they're not, um, um, they're not just different independent origins. Rather, they have, they come in a certain sequence. So, um, kind of sums this up. This is on page 87. Um, the condition of rich and poor was authorized by the first epic that of the strong and weak by the second, that of master and slave by the third. Right? So, uh, these three, riches, power, and mastership, happen really, I didn't make these analogous to power. Riches, power, and mastership happen in that order. Honor is not on that list on page 87. I think actually it will turn out that honor is the first one. Inequality and in honor. Um, so, uh, so as I said, the origin of inequality among men is really complicated. It's a long process, according to Rousseau, in which one kind of inequality eventually, given other circumstances, perhaps makes other forms possible. Um, whereas the answer to this that Rousseau arrives at in the end is pretty simple. The answer is no. <laughs> It's not authorized by the law of nature. Um, at least the kind of inequality we have in our societies now is not authorized by the law of nature. Now, like every once in a while, he mentions another way things could go, which would be kind of an exception to some of the rules he's declaring. And um, it always seems to be the same exception. The exception is Sparta. Right, the ancient city-state, uh, Greek city-state of Sparta, which um, already in ancient times had a reputation as having the best constitution, or you know, although uh, even in ancient times some people really disagreed with that. But um, um, in any case, uh, Rousseau was definitely one of the fans of Sparta. Um, he says that Sparta didn't develop the same bad way that other societies developed. Um, just show this on page 81. Um, 
this is the way most societies developed is that, you know, things were already set up and couldn't be undone by the time people started to notice the defects. So people were continually patching it up, right? They're always just making repairs, but they never setting it up well to begin with. Whereas they should have begun by clearing the air and putting aside all the old materials as Lycurgus did in Sparta in order to raise a good edifice later on. Right, so I mean, I guess historians think Lycurgus is now think Lycurgus is a semi mythical figure, but uh, Rousseau is taking literally the history of Sparta, which says that the you know there was this guy Lycurgus who basically like wiped out the entire old system and started a new one from the beginning. Um, and uh, that system was so good that Rousseau. At, at intervals says various things about it. I mean, basically it, it remained uncivilized in some sense. Um, only the healthiest babies were allowed, were able to survive. Um, it didn't really have a division in rich and poor. Rousseau says it almost didn't have laws. Um, and so Rousseau says that Sparta remained free. Um, and um, that is the, the, of course, not what Hobbes means by saying a city is free, namely that this, the city as a whole doesn't depend on another city, which is true of every commonwealth, but that the, the Spartans remained free, right? Um, so he says, um, this is on page 82, um, it is the same for liberty as it is for innocence and virtue. Their value is felt only as long as one has them oneself, and the taste for them is lost as soon as one has lost them. I know the delights of your country, said Brasidas to a satrap who compared the life of Sparta to that of Persepolis, but you cannot know the pleasures of mine. Right? Uh, I'm sorry, that wasn't all on the screen as I was reading it, was it? Anyway, right, so the point of the story is that the, the Persian who lives under, a, you know, a absolute monarchy, um, but, you know, at least some people are very wealthy and um, they have a lot of, like, nice stuff, basically. So the Persian is saying to the Spartan, you know, oh, look how much better our life here is than your kind of like militarized grim life in Sparta. And the Spartan says back, well, you know, um, I understand what, what you would like about your life, but you could never understand what we like about ours because you'd have to be a free person to understand it, is the way Rousseau is taking this. So um, why am I going into this? Well, it's important for a couple of reasons. One is that in the social contract, oh, someone, you know, I don't, hmm. no, I think it would be distracting to copy and paste the whole page into the book, into the chat. Now let's, um, no, I don't, I don't think we should do that. Uh, but, um, um, sorry, what was I saying? Oh, so one is in the social contract that we're going to be reading next. Um, it's an important question, but uh, I think I'm not sure what the right answer is, whether Rousseau is describing how you would set up any kind of existing commonwealth or is talking about any kind of actual commonwealth that we have at all, or is he only talking about a new Sparta? So uh, that's one reason it's important to bring up this potential exception, right? Like, it, I mean, it has to do with the relationship between what he says here and what he says in the social contract. Um, also, another reason is that we'll see that Wollstonecraft finds Rousseau's cult of Sparta to be disgusting and ridiculous. <laughs> um, so that's another reason to call attention to it. Okay, 
But anyway, are there questions about that? Do people want Alvaro to paste things that I read into the chat? Maybe I should ask you. I don't mind doing it. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, if you're fast enough to f find the place and paste it in, I guess. Yeah, why not? Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Can you quickly <laughs> restate what you said about um, you would have to be a free person to understand um, were you saying like the different, like why people would value their life in different societies? The the point Rousseau is saying that that you like you only know how important it is to be free when you're still free. As soon as you become a slave, you lose your taste for freedom. And uh, I mean, why he should be an exception is a good question. But he's saying that basically, you know, like. Um, people these days are slaves, so they don't realize what they're missing. And uh, but in any case, uh, like Herbert refers to to people these days applies to people these days. In the story, the Persian is an example of someone who's a slave. Right? They live under an absolute monarchy. You know, uh, um, but they feel like it's an advantage because they have all this luxury and stuff. And the Spartan says, well, I understand the pleasures of your life, you know, I, I can see why you would want that, but you can't understand the pleasures of our life because the pleasure of our life is freedom and you have no taste for it. Did that, was that clear? Yes. Okay. Um, I mean, I was mainly, mainly bringing, I was mainly quoting that story to show that Rousseau believes that in Sparta, as opposed to in other kinds of commonwealth, people remain free in some sense, in the sense that's important to him, despite having a commonwealth. So again, that's why it seems like an exception to the way, you know, like the way he goes on to describe civil society and its origin and development in this discourse is very negative. Um, whereas in the social contract, it seems not negative. And so again, like one way of accounting for that would be to say the social contract is talking about Sparta, which is the, just treated as an exception here. Okay. Um, anyway, leaving Sparta aside for now. Um, so uh, Sparta aside, all moral or political inequality violates the law of nature, according to Rousseau's conclusion. Um, now, I mean, what is the law of nature? So um, it's mentioned in the question that Rousseau is answering here. Um, and as we know, Hobbes and Locke both spend a lot of time and energy defining it, what the law of nature is, but Rousseau actually doesn't mention it very much. Um, and uh, he does discuss it briefly in the preface, which I didn't assign, but not again, I think. I mean, I should really do a text search or something to make sure of this, but I believe the first time he starts to talk about the law of nature again is after it's already no longer in effect. So this is on page 79 at the bottom. Um, um, with civil rights thus having become in the common rule of citizens, The law of nature was, sorry, the law of nature no longer was operative except between various societies. When under the name of the law of nations, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so he does, again, he doesn't mention the law of nature until what he says about it is uh, it's been replaced by civil right and the law of nature is no longer operative. Except between different societies, so, um, 
Um, so whatever the law of nature is, it's something that holds between different commonwealths, even now, according to Rousseau. Um, but what is it? So I think the only place he says really, well, even here it's not 100% clear, but the only place he really says what the law of nature, according to him, is, is at the very end. And I guess he has to finally talk about it there because he has to finish answering the question. And the question is, is inequality sanctioned by the law of nature, or authorized by the law of nature? Um, and what he says then is, this is on page 91, Um, inequality in status authorized by positive right alone is contrary to natural right whenever it is not combined in the same proportion with physical inequality. So physical inequality, I take it, it means the same thing as, as what he called natural inequality before, right? Fusis the Greek word phusis is the equivalent of the Latin word natura. So when he says physical inequality, you think he means the same thing as what he called natural inequality, right? So, so he's saying moral or political inequality is contrary to natural right whenever it is not combined in the same proportion with physical, that is, natural inequality, a distinction that is sufficient to determine what one should think in this regard about the sort of inequality that reigns among all civilized people. For it is obviously contrary to the law of nature, however it may be defined, for a child to command an old man. Um, for an imbecile to lead a wise man, and for a handful of people to gorge themselves on superfluities while the starving multitude lacks necessities. So what can we can gather from these examples? What does the law of nature say? Well, it says that a grown man should rule over a child, or at least should be independent of the child. It says that a wise man should rule over an imbecile, and it says that multitudes should roll over um, uh, handfuls of people. In other words, the law of nature is basically the law of the strongest. Where um, strongest refers to natural inequality, physical inequality, as he calls it here. Um, so Vanessa asked, like, survival of the fittest? Well, um, so, um, I mean, I guess it depends what you mean by survival, right? Like, of course, no one survives, everyone dies. <laughs> so, like, uh, um, but uh, the people who are stronger will be able to do more stuff because they're stronger, is what it means. I, he's not thinking about natural selection here. Um, um, I mean, he, he, I don't think, he never says anything about natural inequality being um, heritable. Right? That like the stronger parents will have stronger offspring or anything like that. On the contrary, he always, um, you know, he, he says that um, all these things depend on the circumstances that you live in, how strong you are, how cunning you become, whatever. Um, so, um, yeah, so he's not talking about natural selection, but he, he's talking about the fittest being fitter, <laughs> if you want, the fitness of the fittest. <laughs> Right? So that's the law of nature. Um, this is like not what Locke or Hobbes means by the law of nature, obviously. Um, in fact, this, this is more what you would call a natural law. If it's not just a complete tautology, 
I mean, it's right. It's again, it's just saying that stronger people are stronger or something like that. So, um, but uh, artificial equality goes against it. How does it go against it? Well, um, um, it creates other artificial senses of strong, basically. Right, so like all these things that are gonna, are gonna let people rule over others that are not based on natural inequality are kinds of strength or power that someone can have more of than another, but they're not natural. And, they're, and so in that sense, they're not authorized by the law of nature. Um, meaning just like, um, they wouldn't naturally, they aren't natural reasons why one person could be stronger than another. They're artificial reasons why one person could be stronger than another, therefore not natural. In that sense, they're against the law of nature. Um, but, uh, I mean, that's not necessarily a very interesting sense of being against the law of nature. Right? I mean, obviously, artificial differences are not natural. Um, okay, so, I mean, um, so the, um, By understanding the law of nature this that way, I think, what is an example of something natural that is authorized by the law of nature? Right, so the point is, like, if one person is stronger than another, if one person is taller than another, if one person is older or younger than another, or whatever, then that's going to affect what they can do. And if one of them is going to try to dominate the other, then the one that has that natural advantage will naturally be more able to do that than vice versa. So you might say that the law of nature authorizes that relationship. But again, all that means is that it's natural, basically. I mean, I guess, to get farther into the question of what we mean by saying it's natural and um, but at least it's natural as opposed to artificial it hasn't been created by human convention it didn't need anyone's consent didn't need and, and couldn't have anyone's consent right like you can't ask me do you agree to me being stronger than you I mean by, and by stronger I mean you know literally stronger, like able to lift a heavier weight or whatever. You can't ask me to agree to that. It's not a matter for me to agree or disagree with. You just are, right? That's so that's what that so so that kind of difference is is natural and therefore whatever it results from it is in accord with the law of nature. But I just so um but I just, in a sense, got ahead of myself. So, so one thing I want to say before going on is, therefore, by defining the law of nature this way, um, Rousseau is, um, I mean, on the one hand, he's able to give a very clear answer at the end of the essay. No, it's not inequality. Moral and political inequality is not authorized by the law of nature. On the other hand, that's, he could have given that answer right away. When he first defined the difference between natural inequality and moral and political inequality, he could have already shown from the very definition that the latter, you know, that moral and political inequality is not authorized by the law of nature. So, um, and moreover, like I said, that wasn't really what the academy wanted to know. The academy wanted to know something like. Um, 
is it reasonable? Should we accept this inequality because it's reasonable? Right? Where the law of nature, this is what it means for Locke and Hobbes, the law of nature would be the law of reason. So Rousseau is not directly answering that at the end of the essay. But somewhere in between, he does answer it, I think. So that's um, why he does it that way. I mean, it has something to do with who he wants to understand what from this essay, I think, including his masters who are listening in. Um, but in any case, that complicated thing is happening. But there's also another complicated thing, which is this, that what he doesn't mention at the end is that although the law of nature, so the law of nature is defined by Rousseau as like rule or at least let's say, you know, domination of the strongest. And by strongest, we mean naturally strongest. But, um, so, I mean, in a sense, this law applies in the pure original state of nature, but it, that is, in a sense, it binds there, because in that pure original state of nature, if one person was going to try to get another to do what they want, um, and, the, and the second person was resisting, then what would determine the outcome of that confrontation would be this kind of natural advantage. However, although in that theoretical sense it binds in the pure original state of nature, it's completely irrelevant in the pure original state of nature. Why? Because um, people aren't, aren't, and aren't doing that and can't do that and can't conceive of doing that in the original state of nature. And in fact, they're not even comparing themselves with each other, right? So this strongest is something that, you know, we can apply to the people in the pure original state of nature. And the reason I keep saying pure original state of nature is that um, in the first part, Rousseau uses state of nature to mean these people who, you know, just sleep under the next tree and never see each other more than once in their lives and have no language and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in part two, he starts to extend the term state of nature um, um, up to, you know, the way Locke and Hobbes do up to the beginning of the common like everything up until then is kind of a state of nature. But, but, but then that original pure state of nature, you know, he has to use language like that to refer back to it. So, oh, what does it say in parentheses? Yes, it says naturally. Yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, this is a T. <laughs> Not with an R. All right. Um, all right, so, um, uh, right, so we can look back on that pure original state of nature and say, oh, this person is stronger than this person. This person is wiser than this person. I mean, it would actually would be hard to tell. We can, we can imagine such differences. If we actually could meet people in that state. And Rousseau says, again, there aren't any people in that state now and haven't been for a long, long time. But if we could meet people in that state, we might have a hard time telling which one was stronger or wiser because they wouldn't use those abilities for much. Right? Like they're all strong enough to get enough acorns to eat for today. And if they're stronger than that, they have no use for it. Um, and similarly with, you know, intelligence or wisdom or, well, now it's starting to sound like D&D, &D, but anyway, uh, dexterity. Um, anyway, um, so, uh, um, you know, there's not much use for these abilities in that pure original state of nature. 
and in particular, they don't have the use that they would have in Hobbes' original state of nature, because um, I, I don't look at myself and say, I'm stronger than the next person, let me force them to do something for me. I don't have the concept of comparison, like stronger and weaker. I don't have the concept of compelling someone to do something for me. I don't have a need to compel someone to do some, something for me. Do you mean stronger in a physical sense, mental sense, or a combination? So, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, I apologize. I'm kind of going back and forth, right? Like when I say domination of the strongest, I mean stronger in any natural sense. But then sometimes I've been talking about strength as one of the, like physical strength as one of the ways someone can be naturally stronger. Oh, someone has their hand up. Uh, um, Samantha, yes. yeah. So I, I have a question just because if they can't conceive of these ideas of inequality in those senses because it's, he thinks it's a solitary state of nature, is he also saying that the only way that we've created um, like moral inequality is like because God gave Adam these like ideas of a commonwealth and other things? Because um, he's not really making it clear how, if it's solitary, how a commonwealth even come to be in that sense well actually he i mean he tells a long long story about it right so i mean it starts in this pure original state of nature and it goes through lots of stages that i'm about to describe um okay. so uh so that like the so the the first thing that's missing in that original state of nature um is the thought of comparing myself to others. Um, and I think it's, I don't have that according to Rousseau because nothing, including myself, really catches my attention very much in that state. It's kind of, uh, I'm just kind of wandering around, like picking stuff off trees and eating them. And then when I feel tired, I go to sleep. Um, again, it's, you know, are, are wild non-human animals actually in a state like that? Maybe some of them are, I don't know. Many of them obviously are not, but, uh, um, but this is again, a kind of abstraction. I think this is what a human being would do if there weren't any pre-human instincts of uh, or divine revelations or artificial constructions. So, um, so the first step on the path out of that original state of nature um, is um, that something catches my attention, and what is it? Well. Uh, basically that state is pretty easy most of the time, but it's not completely easy. Sometimes there's a difficulty and then it's necessary to pay attention and learn something. So, um, well, actually, maybe it's not worth reading this. Just on page 70. Difficulties soon presented themselves to him. It was necessary to learn to overcome them, right? And then there's a list of the type of difficulties. Like sometimes the tree was a little bit too tall and I had to figure out how to get to the nuts that were farther up, you know, etc. And then as, the, as people started to multiply and kind of spread out, um, they started to face other problems that changed when they went from one place to another, you know, like here it's colder than it was where we came from. That part, I guess, is historically accurate, right? Humans came out of uh, East Africa and eventually ended up in Europe during the Ice Age. So they're like, it's cold here. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, so these, like they were difficulties and changing difficulties due to changing circumstances. 
Um, and um, it's that which first gives rise to the comparison between myself and everything else. Because I stay the same, but the circumstances change and I have to figure out how to adapt to them. I think, so that's Rousseau's first explanation of how we leave that pure original state of nature and start on a path to something else. Um, so what comes out of that is a kind of uh, enlightened state of nature although it's still previous to the people we call savages or that Rousseau calls savages. That is, it's still um, solitary, it's still pre-linguistic, um, but there's some comparison going down. And especially, of course, what most catches my attention is the comparison between myself and other animals. Um, I, I think, I mean, Rousseau doesn't completely explain this, but I think based on what he says, the reason that, that really catches my attention is that I notice that other animals are able to take advantage of certain situations better than others. And I'm like, well, if I can do what the successful animal does, um, right? So like I see a squirrel climbing a tree or I see a lion hunting a deer or whatever, and I'm like, well, you know, so in those circumstances, if I could do what that animal does, I could get the same success. Um, anyway, um, I, I think that's the connection. Um, it's definitely what he says happens, right? This, again, is on page 70. The repeated counterposition of the various creatures to himself. Again, wondering why I can't, how does that help? Maybe that makes it worse. Well, that makes this get dimmer too. Well, anyway, the repeated counterposition of the various creatures to himself and of each species to the others, much naturally have engendered in man's mind a perception of certain relations. These relationships, which we express by the words large, small, strong, weak, fast, slow, timorous, bold, and other similar ideas, comparisons carried out when needed and almost without thinking about it, finally produced in him a kind of reflection, or rather a mechanical prudence that pointed out to him the precautions that were most necessary for his safety. Right, so the first kind of comparative thinking that we did was to compare ourselves to other animals and to the challenges around us in our environment. And that engendered a kind of reflection, right? Because we had to compare ourselves to things. Um, um, and so now this uh, enlightened relatively, I mean, I'm saying enlightened because uh, Rousseau says, uh, again on page 70, that there a new light, there was a new light uh, thrown on things by this experience. So uh, this kind of uh, more enlightened pre-savage um, does have the concepts of stronger and weaker, for example. So now it's possible for them to think not in so many words because they don't have words yet, but it's possible for them to be of feel that one thing is stronger than another, so to speak, um, and that that's an advantage. Um, and this does lead to a kind of pride, according to Rousseau, but it's, it's a species pride. Because the first thing I notice about other human beings when I take this point of view is how similar we all are to each other. Right? So when I take this point of view, I see, oh, you know, an elephant is stronger than me. Uh, a lion is bolder than me. A squirrel can climb better than me. Right? But then I see one animal and I'm like, oh, that one seems a lot like me. 
um, so, um, um, so this first stage, although it like provides the, po the, the possibility for comprehending something like inequality, um, doesn't itself lead to invention of any moral or political inequality. Um, and this, let me go back to page 70 one more time, at the very bottom. And although his fellow men were not for him what they are for us, and although he had hardly anything more to do with them than with other animals, they were not forgotten in his observations. The conformities that over time he could perceive between them, his female, this is really strange, his female? Where did that come from? I thought that he was living a solitary life. Um, and moreover, what it's saying is that he doesn't notice any inequality between himself, quote unquote, and his female, quote unquote. So why is she his? What does that mean? I don't know. Anyway, that's what it says. <laughs> I'm just reading it. The conformities that over time he could perceive between them, his female and himself, made him judge those he did not perceive. Um, did I want to read more of this? Yeah. And seeing that they all acted as he would have done under similar circumstances, he concluded their way of thinking and feeling was in com complete conformity with his own. So that was a little bit complicated. Maybe it's the female of his species, Grant says. That, I mean, that would make sense. I'm just not sure if his female can mean that. But yeah, maybe. Um, like he's he's starting to notice the um, the differences between different species, and so he's starting yeah. to distinguish between the two sexes. Right. Except except that you know what he notices about the other sex here is supposed to be that it's the same as him. Oh, right? Uh, so it's, uh, I mean, um, and I mean, even though, like, if he was looking at lions, he would notice that, you know, one has a mane and the other doesn't, uh, you know, well, I guess if he's looking at humans, he would notice that one has breasts and the other, you know, but like, in any case, that's not what he, and it's definitely he because it's his female, but there seems to be no reason it's he rather than she or whatever. And like Rousseau entertains the idea of other genders, but you know, but there's, there doesn't seem to be anything gendered about this reflection. On the contrary, it's what what the human being in this state notices is that other human beings are the same as them. So they start being proud of being human beings and not like all those non-human animals, but they're not yet thinking of comparing themselves and, and seeing themselves as better than another human being, the, the insight they get about other human beings is they'll probably do, I can probably understand what they would do in certain circumstances because it's probably the same thing I would do. So this is the beginning of a kind of um, political science, I guess you could say, only again, it's pre-linguistic, so it can't be a science in Hobbes's sense of science, right? I mean, it's merely experience. Um, and, um, but like a way of reacting to this particular animal that involves assuming that it will reciprocate. By reciprocate, I mean, will act the same way I would, given what I'm doing. Um, and so I think that's why Rousseau says that this is the first time when there's, quote, some crude idea of mutual commitments and of the advantages to be had in fulfilling them. However, um, Rousseau makes it clear that at this stage, there's no, there's still no foresight. 
So um, these people can make a contract in Hobbes's sense. Again, not really, because to make what Hobbes calls a contract, you have to use words, basically. But uh, these people can, you know, can kind of like gesture towards like, if you, you know, help me lift this tree, I'll help you lift it or whatever. And then expect the other person, because they, they notice that it's in the other person's interest to also help, right? Or like if you chase an animal towards them that's big enough for both of you, you can expect that they'll kill it and share it with you or whatever. But they can't make what Hobbes would call a covenant because they don't look ahead to what they're, someone else is going to do later at all. Right, so it's not as in Hobbes that they can't make a covenant because they don't trust the other person to fulfill their commitment. They can't make a covenant because they don't have the concept of a covenant. And they, they don't have a concept of a covenant because they don't have the concept of planning for the future. Okay, so this state, again, obviously, although it's not the pure original state of nature, it's still very far away from the state that we actually find people in even quote-unquote savages, let's say nomadic hunter-gatherers. Um, they aren't like us I do all. have a question. Yeah. So in the pure state of nature, um, you were saying that, that everyone's on their own, and then once they have these ideas of comparison in any way, they're in almost a different state of nature. It's no longer pure. And that's when they can begin to understand someone being stronger than another, which is um, what he's saying that the law of nature is. But does that mean that the law of nature is not actual, not actually present in the pure state of nature or that it is present, but people don't know what it is? Well, yeah, I mean, that's what I said about it before is that it's binding, so to speak, in the pure state of nature, but it's irrelevant because the people in the pure state of nature don't can't understand it. So it's, I mean, I don't know what the right way to describe that is, but I, I think it's the second thing you just said, okay, right? The people sense. don't themselves can't, don't recognize it and can't recognize it. Um, right. Whereas in this second state, they still don't recognize it, but they're starting to have the concepts that they could use to put it in, right? They have the concept of stronger, only they don't use it for... I mean, why think this exactly? I think, like, to really justify this, um, it would have to somehow be built into the terms of Rousseau's original abstraction. I don't know exactly how to do that. But anyway, I just know that Rousseau says that at this stage, they still don't compare to each human, other human beings to them with respect to differences. They only notice the similarities. I mean, I think it does have to do some, it has something to do with the fact that we're starting with an abstraction that they basically, they are all the same. Um, they're not real people, they're abstractions from real people. <laughs> um, but, uh, but still, I don't know exactly how to put, put that in and get the exact sequence that he gets here. But anyway, so that's, that's what he says happens. So, and, and so, although this does create some new possibilities for interaction between human beings, it's still only, like in a pure original state of nature, the only interaction was sexual and it was momentary. In this new state of nature, they sometimes will hunt things together. Or they sometimes will, you know, overcome some larger obstacle by helping each other, you know, one stands on the other one's shoulders to reach the nuts, whatever. But like, as soon as they finish that transaction, they, they wander away again and they never see each other again. Um, so the important thing is, um, the transition from this state to what I'm going to call, and I think this is, I guess I'm going to erase this stuff, even though I'll probably regret it. Right, we had the pure state of nature. And then 
then we have what I'm calling the enlightened state of nature. But again, enlightened here doesn't mean that they're all really smart and philosophers or something. It just means a little bit of light has entered their intellect and they're starting to form concepts, basically. So, um, but then we have what I'm going to call, and what I think Rousseau mostly calls, the savage state. Right? I'm calling it this, and Rousseau so, at least sometimes calls it this, because um, according to Rousseau, this is the state that, the first state that we actually find people in the world still living in today. And those are the people we call savages. So here's the question. If it's, uh, if it's solitary in the original state of nature, how do they have the concept of sex and know they must do that in order to procreate? I think Rousseau doesn't think that they, they know they must do that in order to procreate. I think he, Rousseau thinks they know they want to do that. So yeah, as will you, do you go by William? William or Will, either way. Okay. So as William or Will says, instinct. Yeah. So, I mean, of course, I keep saying that we are abstracting from all animal instincts. But, of course, Rousseau has to allow people in this state some kind of instincts or they wouldn't be animals at all, right? I mean, animals need to desire to eat and drink, for example, or else they would just stay in one place and starve. So, like, like exactly how to make out that distinction, I'm not sure, but I think, yeah, Rousseau is including the sexual instinct here. So, you know, like in the original pure state of nature, when um, at least Rousseau assumes, but there's no particular good reason to assume this other than, I guess you'd say, a teleological reason, but that it's people of opposite sexes see each other in the woods and say to themselves, hmm, I kind of feel like doing something. <laughs> and then they do it, <laughs> right? And say, but, you know, the truth is there's nothing Rousseau says here that requires that the people be of opposite sexes or have the concept of opposite sex or let alone of what we call gender um, right, which, as they always say, is socially constructed, right, so this state is pre-social. <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, uh, uh, we don't know exactly how it works, but in any case, it's people with the right kinds of gametes do this often enough that the species continues. Um, um, all right. I mean, that's his explanation. Like, again, is that, is that realistic? Um, like, in terms of how our earliest Homo sapiens ancestors lived? No. I, I mean, you know, chimpanzees don't live that way. You know, but anyway, that's, that's the way it's, that's the way Rousseau imagines it. Or the way his abstraction requires it to be. Um, okay, maybe I said more about that than I needed to, though it is an interesting topic. All right, so anyway, back to the savage state. Um, so that, oh, see, I right away, I'm, I, like I said, I'm regretting having erased that list of things, right? But what I claimed was that the first kind of inequality was inequality in honor. And that's what Rousseau says originates in this savage state. So this is represented, or that is, Rousseau represents this as arising, first of all, fortunately we're still on the topic of sex here because Rousseau represents it as arising, first of all, from sexual competition. And according to Rousseau, the prerequisite for that is a permanent society. People who don't just wander away again after they meet each other. And Rousseau conceives of that as requiring a sedentary life. Now, um, again, this is not true, right? Nomads 
actually nomads don't just wander around randomly. They certainly don't ran wander around as individuals randomly. Even as a group, they know where they are. They go back and forth, you know, they get one place in the spring and another place in the winter or whatever. But, uh, but anyway, Rousseau is thinking that in order for people to remain together, they have to settle down in some place. And, um, and what requires that? So again, this is like not right. I don't know if I should keep saying this how many, so many times that it's not right. But anyway, he thinks that um, what would require you to settle down in one place would be the invention of houses or huts, um, right? Because if a savage makes it, it's, it's a hut. <laughs> no matter how elaborate it is, that's a hut. So anyway, uh, the invention of houses, let's say, and um, um, now the reason I say this is wrong is because, of course, nomads don't sleep under the next tree they find or in caves they, they, they stumble upon. They carry their houses around with them, right? They live in wigwams or tents or yurts or whatever. But in any case, this is the way Rousseau is imagining. The first invention of a house was the invention of a house that's attached to the ground, the way our houses are. And as soon as that was invented, um, people, started, people started living in the same place. And then what happened? So this is described on page 73. Um, Young people of different sexes live in neighboring huts. The passing intercourse demanded by nature soon leads to another through frequent contact with one another. So in other words, like people start living in the same place. Some people are living near each other. The young people of different sexes here, uh, uh, again, it's not clear why it always has to be different sexes, but anyway, that's it. So the young people of different sexes um, see each other and they still have that instinct. So this leads to an intercourse demanded by nature. But then since they don't just wander away again, but they see each other again and again, they start to form other connections. And um, um, and how does this lead to inequality? Well, so as he says, just a few lines down in the same paragraph, people become accustomed to consider different objects. That is, different objects of, you know, love or sexual desire, I guess, and to make comparisons. Imperceptibly, they acquire the idea of merit and beauty. Sorry, the, the ideas of merit and beauty that produce feelings of preference. Um, so, um, right, so once people have become sedentary because they're living in huts, they start to compare potential mates. Again, he doesn't say anything at this stage, and I don't know at which stage he thinks people discover this. He doesn't say anything about because they think a strong mate will, pro will produce strong offspring and they want strong offspring or something like that. It, it appears to be just that they start to notice that, hey, this instinct is more fun to engage in with this person as opposed to that person. And so the second person who who falls in that comparison is dishonored relative to the first person. Um, and so what kind of differences make for that difference in dishonor, in honor? Um, just 
just don't know why I never, sometimes I have no problem with this glare on the book and other times it's terrible and I don't know why. People grew accustomed to gather in front of their huts or around a large tree. Song and dance, true children of love and leisure, became the amusement or rather the occupation of idle men and women who had flocked together. Each one began to look at the others and to want to be looked at himself, and public esteem had a value. The one who sang or danced the best, the handsomest, the strongest, the most adroit or the most eloquent became the most highly regarded. Most eloquent. I think it's sometime before this. He just yeah. On the last page, he discovered that he describes the origin, the origins of language. Um, the explanation he gives of it is not very clear, so that's why I'm not going into that. But um, at some point, they've they've discovered at least a crude kind of language. They start to compare potential mates. They start to compare potential mates in terms of. How well do they sing and dance? How strong are they? Um, how well do they speak? Um, um, so, um, in other words, these are the kind of advantages that people can have over each other when, in fact, the only advantage, or sorry, these are the things that people can be esteemed for over others when, in fact, the only advantages that people have are still natural advantages. Right? There is no property yet. Well, there's a kind of property. I mean, people have huts. But Rousseau says that, the, you know, there would normally be no point in trying to take someone else's hut. It wouldn't be worth the trouble, basically. So, um, so that kind of property doesn't accumulate um, and doesn't generate. He says it might generate some quarrels or disagreements, but um, basically, it seems like it's not very important at this stage. So, uh, um, so the basis for esteem and disesteem or honor and dishonor are still these natural advantages and disadvantages. Um, but just because they've started to stick around each other long enough to make comparisons, so a couple things happen. First of all, differences that were unimportant in the pure state of nature. Because I guess you could say they weren't differently esteemed by nature. Right? Like someone who could potentially sing better in a pure state of nature, where singing hasn't been invented, uh, first of all. But second of all, even if it had been, it wouldn't help you get more acorns. And in any case, you don't need more acorns. <laughs> you already, everyone can get as much as they need, basically. So, um, so that natural difference that exists between me and someone else is completely dormant. It doesn't, um, it doesn't, you know, like I said, it's not esteemed by nature itself. It's only once human beings start to gather together in front of the, around the big tree or whatever, um, that they start to notice these differences. And then, of course, to cultivate them, or if they can't cultivate them, to uh, try to pretend they have them and get other people to pretend they have them. So I think that um, as in Hobbes, but of course Hobbes thinks it's original to the state of nature, whereas Rousseau thinks it comes only at this much later stage. And I know you could say, well, this is only the third stage, but Rousseau says that in this whole part, you have to imagine ages and ages passing without any change. Which, again, that part is right. Right? Like the Paleolithic lasted much longer than the other stages put together. Like nothing, people made tools the same way over and over again for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, 
So, um, right, so only in this much later period, but then at this period, Rousseau agrees that this becomes a cause of possible violence, right? Someone else doesn't esteem me the way I feel I should be esteemed, and now um, I'm going to try to make sure they do. And why does this result in violence? Well, one way it results in violence is if they, if they on purpose harm me somehow, that's a sign of their disesteem. So if I can hurt them back worse, the disesteem will be corrected. <laughs> right? They realize, oh, maybe I shouldn't harm that person. <laughs> and then other people will also see. It's the same things Hobbes describes, I think. So this first kind of inequality, um, although it's based on, it's, it's still based on natural inequality, um, it's already in a way not authorized by natural inequality, right? It's things that, um, so even when inequality first, moral or political inequality first arises, it already has this component that's out of step with natural inequality. It's both consistent in esteeming things as making you stronger, which don't really make you stronger, only because of our preferences. They start to make you preferable. And that gives you a kind of power or strength, but it's artificial. Um, and also the situation gives rise to deceit and vanity and um, flattery and all kinds of things like that that make the esteem people are held in come apart from the characteristics that are supposed to lead to esteem. Okay, um, so there's already something worse in the savage state compared to the pure state of nature. However, Rousseau says that this actually is the best state. In particular, it's not a state of war of all against all. Yeah, there are these quarrels, blood is shed, you know, um, because of jealousy, because of vanity, etc. cetera. But, um, um, but it's all pretty limited because there's no armies. Um, there's no territory to defend. It's just the worst it gets to is like, uh, you know, like fight between two people, basically. Um, so, um, um, so he claims that although there are, there is some potential for like violence and uh, various kinds of moral corruption in this state, it's still, this is actually better than either what came before or what will come afterwards. I think maybe he doesn't say exactly why he thinks this state is better. You're just, I think you're just supposed to agree that it's better. Like imagine just living under the trees in your little hut, spending all your time singing and dancing, whatever. Wouldn't that be better? <laughs> um, than either wandering around the forest in a daze or like the way we live now. Um, but if there's an argument for it, it might be something like that. Um, this is where people come closest to both recognizing the law of nature and living by it. Right? They're not completely living by it, but their differences in honor are based on natural differences. And yet, unlike the people in the pure state of nature, they're able to recognize those natural differences. I don't know, that's not a very good explanation, but that's the best I can do. In any case, um, I see I definitely should be getting onto the invention of property and the beginning of civil society. So I'll just say that there's one other thing that Rousseau mentions happens in this state, which is that the beginning of division of labor between men and women is supposed to happen in this state. He doesn't explain why, but presumably it's because of nursing. Um, and at least he mentions that fact a lot in other contexts. 
you know, why is it that the woman tends to stay, now that there's a hut, the woman tends to stay in the hut more? Presumably it's because she's nursing the infant. Um, but um, there's no obvious power asymmetry to that division yet. And he doesn't mention one. Again, despite the fact that in another context he says something like, you know, women have invented beauty and other reasons for preference in, as, a, as like a stratagem for the sex that's, that should be ruled to rule, you know, but there's no basis for that in what he says. Um, and yet he doesn't come back to this later and explain how this, how this kind of inequality gets amplified and turned into a power asymmetry. Okay, but let me move on, unless there are more questions here. Let me move on to the invention of, of property. Now this is kind of the fateful stage, according to Rousseau, right? And he says before, at the beginning of part two, before he starts telling the whole sad story of how we ended up living under tyrants. And by the way, you know, when he talks about how people have ended up living under, under tyrants, he says, by which of course I don't mean the kings of France. And he quotes something that Louis XIV put out, talking about how monarchs are also subject to the law or something. Well, of course, he does mean the kings of France. That's exactly who he means, right? And, but again, of course, he can't say that because he's speaking in his master's earshot, as he puts it. So in any case, um, before he starts telling that whole sad story, he says... Um, this is the very beginning of part two, actually, the first sentence of part two. The first person who, having enclosed a plot of land, took it into his head to say, this is mine, and found people simple enough to believe him, was the true founder of civil society. What crimes, wars, murders, and what miseries and horrors would the human race have been spared had someone pulled up the stakes or filled in the ditch and cried out to his fellow men, do not listen to this imposter. You are lost if you forget that the fruits of the earth belong to all and the earth to no one. So, right, this was the turning point. But as Rousseau goes on to say immediately after that quote, it's, uh, it's you know, maybe if it had happened all of a sudden, like in the pure original state of nature, someone had suddenly put up stakes and said, this is mine. Maybe put, people could have realized how dangerous and wrong this was, but, uh, but it didn't happen that way. It happened gradually. First, we went through these stages, and then how did we get to this one? Well, um, so first of all, by property, Rousseau mostly means real property. Right? That is, unlike Locke and Hobbes, he doesn't, like he'll say, life, liberty, and property. He doesn't consider your life and liberty to be part of your property. When he says property, he means stuff that you own, but he means especially land. Also, maybe cattle, he mentions. And maybe tools, which he recognizes more than Locke does, but still forgets about sometimes. So he's talking basically about land, and according to him, um, what brought about the idea of real property was the invention of agriculture. So why did ag the invention of agriculture, which, uh, well, no, I'll say that in a second. So why, did the, why would the invention of agriculture bring about the idea of real property? I think basically the main thing is that agriculture requires foresight. You have to plant things now and expect to harvest them later. And so you take time now that you could be using to hunt and gather, and you invest it in the harvest you expect to get later. 
So as soon as people start to do this activity, they have to start to plan ahead. And I think, you know, this means, without going into the details where Rousseau says this in the text, I'm kind of putting different things together here, but I think what this means is both that um, I have reason to try to deter other people from taking my stuff when it finally comes up in the future, and at the same time, I can start to expect that they can be deterred by a threat in the future. Right? So in other words, I, if I say, hey, you better not take my stuff when it comes up. And if you do, I and everyone else around here are going to get you. Then for the first time, I have the understanding and reason to say something like that, and I can expect you to understand it for the first time. So, um, so basically, this is like this stage is like the stage at which we become mature in Locke's sense. That is, we become free of the law of reason. We start to understand um, the limits that reason will put on us if we want to be able to enjoy our, the fruits of our own labor in the future. We have to, you know, lay down our rights to interfere with other people and so forth. Um, and so, in effect, um, Rousseau is saying that just as perhaps if we could stop our own life before, before the stage of maturity, that's when we would stop it. If we could stop the progress of civilization before that stage, that's when we would stop before the age of reason. It's interesting for Rousseau to say this because obviously what Rousseau himself engages in is completely, and he knows this, is completely a product of um, the development of reason. So in any case, um, um, what led to the invention of agriculture in turn? So I'm trying to kind of drawing this the wrong way, right? The invention of agriculture led to the concept of real property. According to Rousseau, what led to the invention of agriculture was the discovery of iron. That is, of making tools out of iron. Now, again, this is like totally wrong, right? Agriculture was invented in the Neolithic, so-called because it's still part of the Stone Age, right? So there was no iron or even bronze when agriculture was invented. Um, and this, the, the New World civilizations basically were still in the Neolithic when, at, um, at the time of European conquest. Um, and yet, obviously, they had very developed systems of agriculture. So this is this theory is not true, but it's still kind of interesting the way it works out. In the interest of time, I'm just going to read this it's on page 76. Once men were needed in order to smelt and forge the iron, other men were needed in order to feed them. The more the number of workers increased, the fewer hands there were to obtain food for the common subsistence, without there being fewer mouths to consume it. And since some needed foodstuffs in exchange for their iron, the others finally found the secret of using iron to multiply foodstuffs. Right? So what happened is some people, the invention of iron was basically the invention of something that required a specialized occupation. Maybe in real life, stone tools were like this, right? But in any case, in Rousseau's mind, it was the invention of iron that required this. So now it's sufficiently involved that certain people have to spend all their time processing the iron and making it into tools. And so everyone else has to get the food for themselves and for the tool making people. And at this point, everyone else discovers that, hey, now that we have this iron, we can make plows and we can start to grow a lot of food. Um, and this division of labor causes what money causes in Locke. 
So in other words, Rousseau is basically using tools the way I said Locke maybe should have, right? It gives a reason for people to accumulate more of something than they need. Because there's someone else who I can count on to need some of what I need and to have something else to give in exchange. So like if I want iron tools, um, but I can't, I'm not, a specialist who can make iron tools, but I know how to grow stuff so I can grow enough food for me and the tool maker. And the tool maker, meanwhile, I know will make enough tools for themselves and me. And then I can rely on being able to exchange these things. So now there's a reason to try to accumulate more and more stuff. Um, now, I mean, like, to begin with, of course, that doesn't necessarily cause inequality, right? Everyone has a reason to get more stuff than they did before. Um, but there's two reasons that it does lead to a division into rich and poor. Right, so this is that division. I'm obviously not going to get to the end of this time. I'm only three minutes left, but I'll see what I can do next time, I guess. But um, so Rousseau does mention the reason that Locke mentions how this generates inequality. Some people are more industrious than others. Some people are stronger or smarter or whatever than others. In other words, there is some basis for the emerging inequality in natural inequality still. But there's also a completely, uh, completely artificial source of inequality, according to Rousseau, and that is the fluctuating exchange rate between commodities. So the very way that all of this comes about Right, that it starts with the division of labor and the need to exchange commodities, um, and therefore leads to agriculture and real property, means that built into the foundation of the whole system is that there, there are two things, and I'm relying on the other person to need um, my surplus of grain, let's say, just as much as they're willing to part with the amount of tools that I need. But it might not be the case. It might be, as Rousseau says, and I think that's what he means. This is, again, on page 76. This is like an example of what a circumstance that might come up. The farmer had a greater need for iron, or the blacksmith had a greater need for wheat. That's a little bit ambiguous, but I think what it means is sometimes maybe the farmer needed iron more than the um, blacksmith needed wheat. Therefore, at the end of the sentence, and in laboring equally, the one earned a great deal while the other barely had enough to live. Right? So with the natural inequality remaining exactly the same, they're each just as industrious as they were before. They're producing the same amount per unit labor as they were before. But just because, unluckily for me, the blacksmiths around here don't need as much wheat as I'm producing, whereas I need lots of iron, more than they're producing, therefore I have to work extra hard to get what to me is of the same value, basically. So my labor becomes worth less than the blacksmith's labor through no fault of, through no fault of anyone, really. No one did this on purpose, yet. <laughs> that will come later. <laughs> no one did this on purpose yet, but, but, but just because of market conditions, as you might say, this inequality emerges. It's completely artificial. It has no basis in nature. But once it's there, like other inequalities, it will tend to perpetuate and amplify itself. Um, and in this, through this function, there comes to be a completely unnatural distinction between the rich and the poor. 
which obviously I'm going to have to talk about next time. Unfortunately, we're also supposed to start the social contract next time, so I'll see what happens. But uh, you know, I'm going to have to explain how Rousseau says that this state leads, first of all, to a state of war. This is where we finally get something like Hobbes' state of nature. After this has been going on for a while, and then afterwards, after that, people, to get out of that war, finally institute civil society. Okay, so like I said, I'll talk about that on Thursday, I guess. I will see everyone Professor, then. Oh, yes. Do you have time after class? I just had a quick question about an essay. Um, okay. Um, sure. Uh yeah, I mean, you can ask, and anyone else who wants to hear the answer can stay, I guess. And I'll keep recording. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, my question is for the second question, yeah. um, and it's about the money aspect. So my question is... Is it like money basically creates a form of inequality because the whole point, excuse the dog, that's my neighbor. Um, the whole point is that in the state of nature, you're only supposed to take as much as you need and share what is going to perish and then money creates like a form of inequality. Well, money creates so according to Locke, the way money makes inequality possible is that the law that you can own it, 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 you can own it. Can you still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I can hear you now. Okay, I don't know what's going on. It's that rap thing all over again. Anyway, um, oh, I did that rap thing again. <laughs> Yeah, you were like, you can only, you can only, you can only. <laughs> Someone should record those and I can make a TikTok out of them. Anyway, um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, or what was I starting to say? Money and inequality. Oh, in right. So you can still only keep as much as you can use before it spoils. But money is doesn't spoil. Right? Like the first things people use is money whatever they are, they're things that don't spoil quickly. So it could be gold and silver, or it could be shells or pebbles or whatever Locke says, but it has to be something, well, it has to be something not terribly common and easily portable and not perishable. So um, once everyone has agreed to accept non-perishable stuff in exchange for, um, um, in exchange for useful things, for like plums and nuts and whatever, then uh, I'm both allowed to have as much of it as I want and there's an incentive for me to accumulate as much as I can because I won't have to ever have to give it away. I mean, until I die, then I'll give it to my children. But does that mean that when money comes into play, people are also agreeing to have that be a sense of currency or uh, property? Well, it's already property, right? So even before the invention of money, if I go out and find a, you know, a pretty stone or something, and I'm like, hey, I like that, and I pick it up, now it's mine, because I've mixed my labor with it. But before the invention of money, all it was good for was, oh, let me look at my pretty stone, right? So in that time already, I could accumulate as many pretty stones as I wanted, because they won't spoil. If I like pretty stones, I can go ahead and build a huge pile of them, but I have no strong reason to. Um, and, and unless everyone else really loves pretty stones for some reason, I'm not like, they're not looking at me and saying, how come he has so many? They're like, oh, he likes pretty stones, right? So, but it's once we agree that the pre that one pretty stone is going to be worth a, bu a bushel of wheat. Now, um, everyone has a reason to want lots of, of pretty stones. 
whether they like looking at them or not. Because everyone knows that someday they might want a bushel of wheat. Even if they don't, even if they have enough right now, they might need more later. This pretty stone is gonna last. So if I have a choice, I should get one. So, so do you understand now there's an, ins not only is it property and not only is it permanent property that there's no limit to, but there's a reason to have more of it than other people or to have as much of it as I can, basically. It's not I think, necessarily. I think I get it. I just, I'm still stuck on like money assigned. So like does money assign value to something that they might've never wanted before? Yeah, right. It's something that there was either no reason to want before or no strong, no universal reason to want before, right? Unlike plums, which, well, I guess some people like them more than others, right? But it's like, it's food, you know, there's a reason you want it. But, uh, but like diamonds, gold, shells, whatever, stuff like that, you don't really have any use for them, except, you know, maybe you kind of like them. So, um, um, so they're, they're taking some, something that had very limited and uncertain value and putting a large and certain value on it by convention. Okay. Right? Only by everyone, not necessarily explicitly agreeing, but at least tacitly agreeing. It comes to be known that if you have this kind of stone, you can exchange it for stuff. Now everyone wants it. And now that that doesn't immediately create inequality, right? Everyone can go out as many of, get as many of those stones as they can find or whatever, but it does mean that um, there's now a possibility of inequality because I can have as many of them as I want. Okay, um, so money is the root of all evil. I'm not saying that locks <laughs> the plot. I'm just saying that like that's what it feels like right now. Well, um, because it basically like it's like makes people greedy. Um, Locke does describe it in a way that, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a negative light, but it's also, according to him, you know, part of what eventually makes civilization possible, which according to him is obviously good. So I think I think it's fair to say he has mixed feelings about it. Um, it's okay. definitely the root of all inequality, but you know, um, um, maybe he thinks some inequality is necessary. Okay, thank you so much, Professor. Okay, um, no problem. I do have a quick question following yes. that is, um, does that mean in this like tacit agreement on using money that you can accumulate like a lot of perishable goods and allow them to spoil because you used your like money to buy them or does it still follow that they can't do that but they can accumulate a lot of unperishable things like money and stones and other things like that yeah so i think as i understand it um the law that you're not allowed to keep stuff until it spoils is always in effect um so yeah this doesn't stop it it just provides something that doesn't spoil so the law doesn't say anything about it um but yeah, if you used your money to go out and buy a million plums and then you only eat five and the rest of them spoil, you still violated a law of nature. Now, I mean, that's what it seems like Locke should say in theory. What I don't quite understand is whether he thinks that that is or should be like punishable in a civil state. He doesn't say anything about that one way or another. It's not actually punished in a civil state. At least most of the time, not. Um, okay, I think so I'm following. I don't know how he explains that. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's all. I will. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Good night.